there is one announcement I forgot this morning. Um, in your bulletin, there's a handout for a special business meeting that will take place next Sunday. As for the details, I encourage you to look that over. I encourage you to be a part of that special business meeting as we are discussing improvements we'd like to bring to strengthen our worship and the sanctuary and various other aspects of our church. So, um, moving forward, though, we're going to take we're going to sidetrack a little bit from our series of uh, the events that occurred between Resurrection and Pentecost, and do a Mother's Day sermon. But this sermon is not just solely for mothers. Yes, uh, mothers, grandmothers, motherly like figures, you will be the primary subject and content of what we're discussing. But ultimately, the principles that we can gain from the women we will discuss in Scripture should apply to anybody who seeks to want to make disciples, man or woman, who seeks to want to be an influence, a Christian influence upon their homes and their friends and their workplaces and anyone else who they interact with. And so this morning, yes, it will, we'll be talking about mothers and grandmothers, but I encourage you men and those of you who are not mothers and grandmothers to keep your ears and hearts open as we are discussing the greater principle of discipleship. And, and making disciples and being an influence of the gospel. And so <clears throat> we're going to start off this morning talking about probably what I would consider one of the greatest church theologians um, in the history of the church. Is anybody here, raise your hand if you've ever heard of Augustine or Augustine, the church theologian. Some of y'all are pretty familiar with that. You may not be too familiar with his writings and everything else, but he was someone who predates the modern church by a thousand plus years, but his writings, his influences, his teachings helped set a, helped influence a firm foundation of the early church and continue to influence the church even later years during the Reformation and when Protestant churches started. And even our church today, a lot of our theology today owes to the explanations of Augustine. He was considered probably one of the greatest Western church theologians that had ever walked Christian history. And the interesting thing about Augustine is he attributes much of his ministry, he attributes his conversion, he attributes much of his godly influence in his life to his mother, Monica. See, his mother, Monica, was married um, to a non-Christian man. But though she was the wife of a non-Christian, Monica prayed that her family might eventually all come to Christ. She attempted to bring up her children in the ways of the Lord. And it pained her to see them stray away from the pains of the Lord, or from the pains of the Lord, from, the, uh, from what she taught them. And so the thing is, is she was a mother that prayed fervently and persistently for her family, even if she didn't always see the fruits and the results right in front of her. And But... The story of Monica doesn't end there. See, Augustine would constantly be influenced by his mother. Her mother. His mother would constantly pray for him. She would constantly try to teach him the word and bring him up. But Augustine did not grow up, um, how do you say, he did not come to the faith at a young age. Augustine would ignore his mother's warnings. He would engage in youthful lust and pursued a life of self-gratification and sexual immorality while continuing his education. He lived for the world. He rejected the teachings of the Christian faith. He even pursued and looked at other religions. He's, he was a pain of his mother's heart of how he lived. Yet, Monica may not have the words to convince her son the truth of Christianity, but she determined that she would never stop praying that her son and her family would turn to God. When Augustine went to Italy eventually to teach, Monica, who's by then a widow, her husband did come to the faith right before he died, and that was attributed to his wife's influence. But she decided, if my son's going there, she's going to pack up and follow her son. And so y'all have like, yeah, I have one of those too. Um, but in Milan, she would, where her son was teaching, she would attend a church pastored by the great Pastor Ambrose. And she rejoiced because Augustine would befriend Ambrose and eventually become a Christian. Monica would die in 387 at the age of 56. In his writing, Augustine's writing called Confessions, which was his own autobiography of his conversion, Augustine spoke of his grief and weeping for the mother that he said this, Now gone from my sight, who for years had wept over me, that I might live in your sight, O Lord. She died a happy woman, 
for she had seen her prayers answered when both her husband and her son had become believers. Augustine was only 33 at the time of his mother's death, and many years of service to Christ and his church laid before him. And in later years, Augustine could look back on his life, and he would note in later years the importance of his mother's perseverance and prayer and ministry to his own salvation and ministry. My point is, this morning, is mothers, grandmothers, those who are just dying to be a godly influence upon their family, co-workers, whoever. Persist, persevere in the things that you are doing. Because what we see in this example and countless other examples throughout Christian history is the power of a praying, godly, and committed mother in the conversion of their child. A mother who seeks from the earliest age to nurture the faith and fulfill the Great Commission first and foremost in their children in spite of how their children respond, in spite of what their children may do, in spite of the influence of the world, they persist in what God has called them to do. It is mothers like these who persevere in prayer and the word, who continue in demonstrating through acts of love and service who uphold and teach the word of God above all other priorities. It is mothers like these that we call blessed by God. It is these mothers who are essential in God's work of conversion. It is these mothers who can unknowingly influence entire gener future generations because of their commitment to what their child may become in the Lord one day, in spite of where their child may be at right now. And maybe that's a huge encouragement to some of you mothers this morning who are just brokenhearted over where your children are at right now. Continue to persevere in the faith. Persevere in the prayer. Hold fast and true to the promises of God because it's not over yet. Mothers and fathers, I want to mention fathers too because you play just as much of a critical role as well. Persevere in nurturing the faith in your children far above anything else that you may teach them in this life. Far above any other commitment that pulls their attention and time away. It is of greatest importance. It is the only thing in this life of eternal consequence. And it may be the greatest account that you will give to God and how you cared for the children that were entrusted to you. Take heart in the examples the impact and the appreciation we give to godly mothers and influences who nurture the faith this morning. And so we look in the second Timothy chapter one, verse five, Paul writes this letter from prison in Rome. It's shortly before his death. <coughs> and he's, this is possibly his final letter written in the new Testament. And Paul is writing to Timothy, who he notes throughout scripture that Timothy was like a son in the faith to him. He was a young man that Paul had personally trained, discipled, and helped raise up in the faith. And so Paul is expecting to face execution, and he longs to see his son because he is lonely, because only Luke, the, uh, the author of the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, remains with him. Yet Paul writes, if you notice in this letter, compared to Paul's other letters, this is probably the most personal letter that Paul writes. There's a lot of urgency. There's a lot of emotion in this letter. Not just because he really wants to see Timothy, but because Timothy is a young pastor at the church of Ephesus who is undergoing various trials, temptations, hardships as a young pastor because he has to deal with false teachers. He has to deal with himself being attacked. He has to deal with false teachings in his church. He has to persevere in correct doctrine. And he has to endure in the gospel ministry in spite of suffering and tribulations. And so it's also in the context of 2 Timothy chapter 1 that before Paul goes any further in his charges, his teachings, his commands, his encouragement, he wants to remind Timothy of something. He wants to remind Timothy of his rich spiritual heritage began in him by those who sought to nurture his faith, his mother and his grandmother. <clears throat> and so we see Paul's words in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 verse 5. And it says in 2 Timothy, sorry, let me get there. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. I am, Paul speaking, I am reminded of your, speaking to Timothy, sincere faith. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I am sure dwells in you as well. 
That's one verse, but we can unpack a lot out of that one verse. And the first thing I want us to unpack is a biblical mother nurtures the faith. Now remember, the principles we're talking about of biblical motherhood this morning, a lot of those principles can apply to fatherhood. It can apply to anybody who wants to mentor and disciple, especially the next generation up in the faith. If you want to take seriously your call to make disciples, you need to take seriously your call to nurture the faith and those who are around you. But to give you a little context on Eunice and Lois, there's only one explicit mention of Eunice and Lois in the entirety of Scripture. So what we know, truly know of them in their faith, we cannot simply summarize in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. But how do we know so much about their influential faith? By the legacy that they left behind in the, as the mother and grandmother who nurtured the faith of Timothy. It was their legacy that spoke of their faith. Eunice was a Jewish believer who had been married to a Greek man uh, based on Acts 16, verse 1. And it is assumed from the context of Scripture that Timothy's, Timothy's father was not a believer. Lois was either Eunice's mother or mother-in-law. And the fact that she helped rear Timothy may indicate that Timothy's father had died or that the family all lived together, which was not too uncommon in those days. It is possible that the father had died while Timothy was young, since Paul takes on a fatherly role with Timothy, often referring to him as my true son in the faith. We see that in 1 Corinthians 4 and, and in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And much like Augustine's conversion, Paul attributes Timothy's own conversion to the faithfulness of these godly women who took seriously their call to nurture the faith in their own household first by teaching Timothy the scriptures and living out their faith before him. In spite of their circumstances, such as Timothy's dad being an unbeliever. And so Paul has such reverence for the genuineness of the faith that Eunice and Lois nurtured in Timothy. And that he reminds Timothy of his rich heritage. And why is he reminding Timothy of his rich heritage? To encourage Timothy, because in verse 4, what do we see in 2 Timothy 1 verse 4? That Timothy had shed tears before Paul. What were the tears that Timothy shed? Was it because they had a, 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 a sorrowful, tearful goodbye as Paul was dragged off to Rome from Timothy? Or... More than likely, it could be tears that Timothy shed in confidence to his father in the faith over pastoral troubles that he had faced in his beleaguered church in Ephesus. And I know that how that is. I long for my dad because I used to share my dad the troubles of my ministry. And every pastor knows at some point in your ministry, you will shed tears of the people that you care and minister to. I like to think that is what Timothy is going through. We know from Scripture that Timothy was young and inexperienced in his pastoring. He was known to be shy or timid, and he was prone to frequent sickness. He had a weak constitution. He dealt with illnesses on multiple occasions. And so combine all that, Timothy probably struggled in the ministry. But Paul's encouragement to young Timothy is to remind Timothy that you have not failed, nor is your struggle because of weak faith. Because it is very tempting when we're doing things for the Lord and we're not seeing the results that we want that we blame ourselves and say, well, maybe it's because I'm not strong enough in the faith. Maybe it's because I'm too weak in the faith. Maybe I don't have faith at all. Maybe I'm a failure. And Paul is encouraging young Timothy, reminding him in his encouragement of the ones who helped him grow in the faith and come to faith in Christ in the first place, that he may be encouraged by the examples that go before him. Paul is not taking credit for this. Notice that. Paul doesn't take credit for this. But he gives the credit to influential mothers and grandmothers who walked in a deep, living, genuine, sincere faith. See, genuine, sincere faith, church, is contagious. It not only penetrates the heart and will of the one who has it, but when your faith is genuine, it overflows so that everything and everyone around you is touched by it. Now, what I want to get at is this does not mean that Timothy was bred into the faith, or he just grew and eventually just kind of grew and assimilated into becoming a believer. But it means, rather, he had seen real, authentic faith lived out before him. Then he came to Christ and he sought to model their example so that the, their genuineness and their faith became what characterized Timothy's genuineness and the faith. 
The effects of godly people who believe in us and demonstrate faith to us is beyond measure. Timothy was called to remain passionate for the ministry by recollecting the examples of Eunice, Lois, and Paul. He was their boy in the faith. <coughs> but then we see a second example in Scripture I'd like to briefly talk about. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, we're going to go a little further because you're somewhere like, well, how in the world did Mary nurture Jesus if Jesus was God? We'll talk about that in just in a moment. But what I want us to see is we see the evidence of Mary faithfulness of her faith of her righteous character prior to jesus's birth in her calling and that as the angel gabriel delivers to her the spectacular news that as a virgin she will become pregnant by the spirit and carry in her the womb in her womb the son of god this is news that would undoubtedly upend her life nothing would be the same after this this is probably not what she grew up planning for this is news that undoubtedly would carry the murmurs and rumors and disdain of others who could not believe such a miracle could occur, more than likely, she was probably labeled as a harlot, that there was rumors spread around her. We have some biblical evidence that they insulted Jesus by insulting his mother, his, his genealogy. Even We know even for a short moment, Joseph wanted to divorce her because he didn't believe her. This was news that would threaten her existence because the penalty of adultery was death. If it wasn't death, it was shame. Not to mention later, when she does have Christ, what does she have to do? She has to flee to Egypt with her family to escape Herod, who sought to kill Christ. So what we see is Mary knew the risk, and she could not fully comprehend how all this was going to happen. She didn't know the outcome, but you know what she did know? She knew that God was faithful, he was true, he was just, and he was good. And in spite of her not knowing everything, that was enough to know. Her response is seen in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, where she says, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That she is telling the angel, I don't need to know everything. Just know I am your servant and let it be done. What better hands to entrust the Savior of the world, God incarnate, the Son of God, now also the Son of Man, than not in the hands of a rich woman, not in the hands of a powerful woman, not in the hands of a businesswoman, but in the hands of a godly, faithful woman. But then some of us are still in the back of our heads saying, how did Mary, who was human, who was inherently imperfect, nurture Jesus, who is perfect, who is God? And we're going to go through something very briefly. And if you, if you tune me out, you're going to be completely lost if you jump in the middle of this. We're about to dive into a little bit of theology. Uh, Micah got a preview this morning in the membership class. We must not lose sight of Jesus' full humanity for his full divinity. Nor do we lose sight of his full divinity because he was fully human. Within Jesus, the person of Jesus, there are two full natures that exist in Jesus. One that is fully human and one that is fully divine. These two natures do not compromise each other. Jesus being fully human does not make him less than God. Him being fully God does not make him less than human. They don't intermix and you have some kind of hybrid third thing, but they find their union in the one person of Christ so that we can confidently claim that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And this is how we can explain in Scripture the miraculous acts of Jesus that these acts occur through his eternal, infinite, divine nature as God. This is how we can say Jesus accurately claimed to be God because he does have a fully divine nature. But at the same time, we see things that Jesus goes through that cannot be attributed to God's nature, such as him suffering. God is impervious to suffering because to suffer implies weakness. God cannot be weak or he would not be omnipotent. We see things like he hungered and he thirsted and he suffered and he died. These are things that God's nature cannot do. That Jesus in his human nature has limitations because he has a physical body. He can only, in his human nature, I keep, notice I keep saying that, in his human nature, he can only be at one place at one time. Uh, when we hear the phrase, he did not know the day or the hour, some of us have wondered about that. How can Jesus, who is the Son of God, not know what God the Father knows? Because that would imply that as the Son of God, he is not as all-knowing as the Father, which would be a huge heresy and a false teaching. So how can Jesus say, I don't know the day or the hour? Well, in his fully human nature, he doesn't know the day or the hour. But in his fully divine nature, he certainly does. 
And so, Scripture will speak to Jesus' fully human nature as well as his fully divine nature. Now, some of you may already be lost. It's all right. Church theologians have went through this for, throughout the ages. How could this be? And if you want a really fancy word this morning to, to take home with you, look up hypostatic union. <laughs> hypostatic union. That's the big word. H-Y-P-O. S-T-A-T-I-C. Man, y'all might have me misspell right here on the live stream. Um, but it is founded in church doctrines. It's founded in the Baptist faith and message. It's founded in church councils throughout the ages. This is how we can explain these two aspects of Jesus. Because here's the thing. For Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice to cover all the sins of humanity and satisfy God's righteous judgment, he had to be fully God. Because only God can satisfy God's demands. But for Jesus to be our perfect substitute, he has to be fully human because only a human can represent humanity. And so we see the, the, the two natures of this joined together in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. As I read this, pay particular attention to verse 14 and verse 17. And it says this, Since therefore the children... Speaking of us, share in flesh and blood, he, Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not the angels he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Verse 17, therefore he had to be made like his brothers. But what's the key? In every respect so that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. See, the author of Hebrews affirms that Jesus being fully human does not mean simply he was flesh and blood like us and that was it. And he was possessed by some spirit. But what it means, what he's saying is he had to be like us in every respect. Everything that it means to be human, a human mind, a human will, human emotions, human development, Jesus had to have that to be fully human. If he was less than human, he could not be our perfect substitute, our perfect representative. And so this means that Jesus was not just flesh and blood, but he had to grow as a human does, not only physically, but in learning, maturing, and development. Think about this. How did God choose to enter into humanity as a full-grown man, as a teenager? No. Did he even choose to enter into humanity as a baby? No, no for the conception. Scripture is very clear that he was conceived by the Spirit in the womb of Mary. So Jesus enters the point of humanity where human life truly begins, conception. Everything that God designed man to be, experience, and do in the beginning prior to the fall, Jesus must experience in full humanity, but he's experiencing it in a fallen world. That's why he's greater than Adam. Because Adam failed in a perfect world, Jesus is carrying full humanness in a fallen world, but without sin. This is why scripture can say, we have a God who can truly claim to understand what we're going through to be sympathetic in our struggles. This means that Jesus being fully God possesses the mind, the being, the will, the power, the, the knowledge, the essence, the attributes, the nature of God in its fullest. But this same Jesus being fully human and his, full in, fully, and his human nature possesses a human mind, a human will, a human heart, a human body, and human limitations subjected to all the same processes of development that humans were designed to experience prior to the fall. And we see this example in Luke's gospel. I'm getting somewhere with this by the church. I'm not just on a random side tangent. It's in my notes. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, speaks of Jesus' development. What does it say? And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Well, Jesus is fully God, and we forget about his humanity, then how can God increase? God cannot increase. What is perfect cannot become more perfect. This is attributed to Jesus' humanity. Jesus grew in stature, meaning as in his human nature, he had to learn to crawl. He had to learn to walk. He had to learn to run. He grew from an infant to a boy to a young man to a man. He physically grew as a human does, learning the physical processes that come with human growth, like learning how to talk, 
But Jesus grew not only in body, but he grew in wisdom. He grew in the soul. Like every other human, he grew in wisdom and knowledge. Even by age 12, Luke could say in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, that Jesus was filled with wisdom. Not because he got it all at once, or always had it as a human, but because he was learning. Jesus learned from the scriptures, and I'm confident that Jesus learned from his mother. He learned in community. He learned in the power of the Holy Spirit in his humanity. And he increased in wisdom by carefully observing everyday life on how to navigate God's word. So when scripture attributes things to Jesus that seem contrary to the divine nature of God, such as suffering, growing, maturing, weeping, dying, thirsting, hungering, it is speaking to the human nature of Christ. This is how Mary, this now coming full circle, now we're getting back to where I was going, this is how Mary nurtured the faith in Christ. God entrusted the spiritual development of his son in his humanity, I keep clarifying that, to a mother who had shown her faithfulness towards the things of God. And undoubtedly her efforts coupled with the influence of others greatly impacted the process of Jesus' human growth. So we get two wonderful examples in scripture, but what I want us to note is biblical mothers nurture faith, but I also want us to notice what is the impact of a nurturing mother. The first thing I want us to see, and I'm going to try to go through this super briefly, one, creates a foundation. Timothy's godly upbringing is referenced again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, where it says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them. Well, when, did, when did he learn them? And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith it, that is in Christ Jesus. Paul's mention of from those whom you have learned probably refers to Timothy's godly mother and grandmother Eunice and Lois who taught him the Jewish scriptures from an early age setting up a strong foundation for him. They, along with <coughs> Timothy, received Paul's teachings about the Messiah and continued to train Timothy in the things of Christ. And here's the thing, prior to even being converted to followers of Christ, they were faithful Jews. And they sought to instill in Timothy the Jewish scriptures, the very scriptures that all point to Jesus Christ and find their fulfillment in him. They unknowingly but faithfully were preparing Timothy and themselves for the gospel. So that by the time Paul came to Lystra on his first missionary journey, Timothy had such a strong foundation laid by his mother and grandmother that it would lead to his conversion. By the time of Paul's second missionary journey, that foundation had been built upon so much by his mother and grandmother that Paul would enlist Timothy to serve with him in the ministry. What we see is that these two women did not disrespect, disregard, or dismiss the power of the word. They held it in highest esteem as breathed out by God. They recognized the value in studying it, applying it, and teaching it, so much so that it was necessary to have their homes revolve around it. Church, should that speak to us this morning? In order for us to influence, be an influence for Christ in our families, in our workplace, in our friendships, in our marriages, our other relations, we need to have the same regard for Scripture that Eunice and Lois had. We, especially parents, mothers and fathers, need to be students of the Word, diligently studying it so we can diligently teach it to the ones that are most precious to us, our children. <coughs> the Great Commission to make disciples starts most importantly and firstly at home. Matter of fact, statistics speak to your influence, if you're a parent here this morning, speaks to your influence. Ten years of student ministry, and I could testify to that. I'll give you the research. Research shows that the assumption that a lot of parents have that their teenagers' friends and their peers have as much influence or even more influence in a teenager's life than their parents is false. Such influence may be significant for a time, but it is short-lived and shallow. What the studies show is only parental influence has a long-term impact on things such as beliefs, personality, and relationships. USA Weekend surveyed more than 250,000 teenagers. 
70% identified their parents as the most important influence. Only 21% said it was their friends. Research also shows that there is a strong relationship between healthy family ties and positive social behavior in teenagers. A study of 20,000 teens and parents confirmed this, stating such strong relationships fortify teens with the courage to make wise decisions. Studies showed that many teens who had left the faith and had little to do with the youth ministry, but more about their family situation. My point is this, parents, what you prioritize, and I say this loudly because this is my heart for teenagers of the next generation, what you prioritize not just on Sundays, but every day is what they will internalize and live by. It's not just what you say with your words on certain days of the week. It is what you live, and your kids will soak that in and internalize it in their life and live by it. It is also what God will hold you accountable for in the end. Nurturing mothers set up a strong foundation, but they also encourage continued growth. If God saw it necessary for Jesus in order to be fully human, to experience the fullness of humanity without sin, which includes to grow as a human does, both in his stature physically and his wisdom spiritually, and in his humanity, how does God ensure this growth? By Jesus being under the care of a godly mother. Then what does that say to us this morning about the importance of our influence as parents in our own homes? How dare we disregard that influence for other trivial matters? If God saw it necessary for the humanity of his own son, then I promise you this morning it is necessary for the spiritual development of your own child. We cannot just pawn it off to the pastor, the youth pastor, the children's pastor. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 7 says this. It says, in these words, and the words he's talking about is the law, the law that was the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. He's not talking about specific time periods and you got to map out the time periods. He's saying, in general, your house should revolve around the word of God. God understood the importance of the home. In fact, he designed the home to be the first church or gathering place for the development of faith. And that before there was a church, before there was a temple, before there was a tabernacle, before there was a synagogue, you know what there was? There was mom and dad. There was the home. God placed the nurturing of the next generation in the faith upon the shoulders of parents in the place of the home. Notice what scripture says in Judges. When Israel strayed and rebelled, which is, by the way, the whole theme of the book of Judges, if you read it, Scripture multiple times noted that this was because the next generation did not know God and did not know his works. Judges 2.10. How could that be? How could, they not, how could the next generation not know God or his works? Because it wasn't being taught at or lived at at home. Two-thirds, 66%. This statistic is what shatters my heart. And this is why I push y'all so much to reach the next generation. Because there will come a point in the next decades that you will look around and there will be significantly less faces in this congregation, if we're honest. Senior adults, what is the legacy we're leaving behind? What are we looking forward to and not just looking around us in our own bubble? Two-thirds, 66% of American young adults who attended church regularly for at least a year as a teenager said they also dropped out between the ages of 18 and 22, according to LifeWay Research. Only 34% said they continued to attend twice or more. And while 69% were attending at age 17, it fell to 58% at age 18, 40% at age 19, and once they reached their 20s, only one in three were involved in a local church. Almost half, 47% of those who dropped out and attended college said moving to college played a role in them no longer attending church. Those who stayed and stayed involved in the church and plugged in with the church even when they went off to college, more than half said the church, they did this because the church was a vital part of their relationship with God and that they wanted the church to guide their decisions in everyday life. But only, here's the other thing, around 4 in 10, 43%, 
said they stayed involved and active in the church and serving with the church because they wanted to follow the example of their parent or another influential family member. They also did another study, and they, they were determining what determines a teenager's spiritual maturity. What determines the 66, 69% from the 34%? What makes the difference? And when they did the study and they looked at, all right, what habits is in this group versus this group, they noticed three predominant trends that are more than likely to produce teenagers that continue on in the faith even after they graduate to be the 34%. They said if a home adopts these three habits on a consistent and regular basis, and by the way, those habits revolve around the parents leading, that it will often double and triple the chances of their children living out faith as adults. You want to know what those three habits were? Parents who had frequent family Bible study, devotions together, number one. Number two, parents who had frequent family conversations about faith in the home. They talked about the faith on a regular basis. And number three, parents who had their children serve others alongside them. And it doesn't have to be through a church event. Church, it's not enough to get them saved. We must run the race with them and do everything in our power to help them see it through. We must make the most of all of our time with them because your time with them is short in the grand scheme of eternity, and yet you have the greatest impact on their life for better or for worse. <clears throat> but it brings me to my last point. For many of you here sitting this morning who can hold your head up high, not because you can boast in yourself, but you boast in Christ, because you're confident in your faith. Many of you can attribute that to, a God, to godly parents or a godly mother or a godly father. So I also want us to remember to celebrate moms who nurture faith. We need to acknowledge their guidance. Notice the importance of Paul doing that in his letter towards Timothy. Paul, when thinking of Timothy's own faith, couldn't help but think of the faith of those who guided him to the gospel. How powerful of a testimony and what a testament to their own faith in Christ that they must have had to get a place in Paul's letter to Timothy about Timothy's own faith. Lois and Eunice are examples of the powerful influence of a mother or grandmother and what they can have on a young man's life. Many personal testimonies that I have heard as a pastor over the years often included a statement like this. When they talked about them coming to the faith, they often say, my mom or grandma took me to church. They taught me right. They prayed for me every day. And when they came to that point where they wanted to receive Christ, that's what they looked back on and drew from. Paul recognized the life-changing contributions of these two women in a day where women were rarely mentioned by name. He honored their impact in preparing his young protege, who later joined Paul in his travels and eventually became the pastor at the church of Ephesus. Lois and Eunice should encourage all mothers and grandmothers, reminding them that their godly influence has an eternal impact on the lives and futures of their children and grandchildren. So for those of you who have one, acknowledge them. And secondly, support their efforts. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Honoring your mother and father is more than just simply saying nice things about them and talking highly about them and respecting them. It is supporting them in their ministry efforts, even if you are the ministry effort. <laughs> it is... It is following their examples of faithfulness. It is obeying them in their teachings and commands that align with Scripture. It is holding their advice and wisdom in high esteem. It is treating them in such regards, both inside and outside the home, that other people could sing praises of your mother. Even Jesus, the Son of God, submitted in obedience to his parents. He honored them through obedience. Luke 2, 51. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to him. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. This was after the temple incident. But why? If he's God incarnate, why does he need to obey earthly imperfect parents? Because in being fully human, he had to fulfill the law perfectly to be our perfect sacrifice and perfect example. This includes him fulfilling the fifth commandment to honor his mother and father. So as we close out and have our invitation, nurturing the faith 
is the most pivotal aspect of godly mentorship and discipleship, especially for godly mothers. But not just for mothers, because not all of us have or had a godly mother in, in our lives. But what we see this morning is the importance of godly influence, the call to endure in prayer for another's sake, the need to consistently point our family, friends, co-workers, and anyone we care about back to Jesus, and the impact that our efforts empowered by the Spirit might have, regardless of a person's background, their lifestyle, or their current situation. We should be always mindful and thankful for those who have influenced and brought us to where we are today in our faith, whether it be our mother, a father, a sibling, a friend, a co-worker, a coach, or a pastor. As we get ready to close out, I'm going to be down here at the front. And the question I have for you, if you want to make that decision to follow Jesus, is, is your mother or is someone influential to you praying for you today? Has there been somebody who has called you to repent this morning, who has prayed for your spiritual welfare, who has spoke to you of the gospel, who has demonstrated to you the love and mercy of Christ and urges you this morning to make the only impact, that, the only decision that will impact your eternity? How will you respond to their urging and nurturing and prayers this morning? Do you wish to experience such a love that is seen in them this morning? Do you know Jesus? Have you put your personal faith and trust in the atoning work of Christ on the cross? If you have not put your faith in Jesus, if you have not received him as Savior and Lord, I will be down here at the front. I would love to walk you through that. If you have, then thank those who have influenced you to that point, and let us stand and sing praises to our God who loves us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, for godly mothers who have built up the next generation of believers. And I pray you continue to encourage them, equip them, and guide them, and that when they speak rightly of Scripture, that we will listen and obey, and that we as a church will continue to remain unified in the things you've called us to do to reach this next generation in Newberry, Florida, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be honored and our lives, and our relationships, and the things we do here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.